Okay, so um, I'm Waldrick Dillo. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and I took over from Dave Jones uh, as Dean of the NIHR Academy uh, last September. Uh, I'm also a consultant endocrinologist um, and lead the Division of Diabetes Endocrinology and Metabolism at Imperial, uh, and also Director of Research for the Trust. Okay, um, so what's the purpose of getting everybody in the room and staying here for three days. So the purpose is A, to hopefully that you'll learn something, but almost as importantly is networking and meeting other people that you've not met before and meeting some of the senior faculty. Um, and many people have given up their time to come and, and travel up to join the, the conference and been involved in organizing it because you guys are the future leaders of NHR. So that's why we invest time and effort uh, in the training because we think this is really valuable. So this has been going now for 13 years. Uh, I've been involved from the very beginning uh, and come to virtually each, each one each year. Uh, and I'll be joining you both today and tomorrow. I need to go to an NHR strategy board on Thursday and Friday, uh, but I think you're gonna have a fun time. So what, are you, what can you expect from today? So the idea is that over the three days, you'll by the end of the day you'll get into groups um, and you'll write a grant application and you'll have interviews on Friday. But actually you need a bit of preparation for that. So we've got some experts who are going to teach you uh, some good, good advice. So we're going to be um, starting uh, with Katrina who's going to tell you about applying for further funding and her own personal experience, which I think will be helpful. Um, and then we've got the lovely Gary Frost at the front there that I've known for about two decades. Um, uh, the Art of Selling Yourself, and Gary's just been awarded an 11 million pound grant, he told me today, so um, it prob probably we could give you some uh, good lessons. Um, and then we're going to have a talk uh, from Jenny about the Art of Selling Your Project. Uh, and then, very important to NIHR and many other funders now are coming on board, is patient and public involvement engagement. And actually there's been a recent um, announcement from the MRC where they're going to be looking at patient and public involvement in their grants as well. And then finally, how do you actually write um, uh, a good grant? Um, so we're going to have Marion Knight, uh, who's just taken over as chair of the research uh, for patient benefit uh, grant scheme, which is a kind of early career grant scheme for people starting out. Uh, and Tanvi, who's going to uh, give you an example of what she's done. So that's the flavor of today. Um, and then the idea is that you take that information uh, write a grant over the next couple of days and then present it on a Friday, just like you would do in a real fellowship situation. Okay, uh, some boring bits, um, but please do listen. Uh, fire alarms, there's no plan to fire alarms. Fire exit is over there. Um, and then we meet out uh, in the main house. Um, uh, toilets, uh, I think most people are probably accustomed to are over there. Uh, refreshments are in your, the, the refreshment breaks are in your, in your pack and the Wi-Fi code is there. Social media, please do tweet uh, and all the other things that you want to do. Um, uh, but be mindful that if you're taking pictures of other people, that uh, some people might not be so keen to be uh, uh, in the media. So just be aware of that. But we're very keen for you to tweet. Uh, and then Thursday checkout is, uh, is by 11. OK, so we are joined by virtual delegates as well. So you guys are, uh, have got the, the joy of being in the room and networking. We have got online people as well who will be joining us mainly for, t for, for today. So um, those people can ask Q&A uh, in the web chat. The breaks will be the same. Uh, closing session uh, uh, at 5.15. And again, please do use social media. Unfortunately, we can't transport dinner uh, and this beautiful venue to those online. But uh, sadly, I, I, I think hopefully you should still get some benefit out of it. OK. Okay, so what's the NHR Academy all about? So what we do is people, basically. So what this slide is, is really saying is we invest in people and, and importantly, people's careers. So um, the NHR Academy uh, is about developing the next generation of researchers which are going to be carrying out the research that we need for the healthcare system that we work in as well as social care. So that's the, that's the bottom line, basically, is providing training programs like this, uh, as well as handing out fellowship uh, competition money. Um, and those are um, uh, incredibly important, I think, um, because a project is about delivering research, but actually it's the people that are going to take things forward uh, and lead, uh, become the leaders of the future. 
So this is a very busy slide, but I think it's actually a brilliant one that I'd like on our homepage if we could get it. Um, because it actually summarizes all of the training opportunities that we offer at the NHR Academy. There are more, so there's obviously MRC, Welk, and other funders. Um, we're not fussy about where people go, we want people to succeed. There's never going to be enough money for everybody to go around. Um, but this just gives you a flavor of what's on offer at the NHR Academy. And what you'll see there at the top in the columns is pretty much at any of the um, stages of your career, there's an offering. And then the rows, basically, the, the green is uh, fellowships for anybody. Any background of, of any kind in healthcare or social care, you can apply for those fellowships. And then additional schemes there in red for allied health professionals, and then in orange for doctors and dentists, both pre- and post-doctorally. And then the blue bit at the bottom, I won't talk about in great detail, but it's worth remembering that it's not just the fellowship opportunities. So there are lots of organizations up and down the country funded by NHR and other funders, charities, etc. So um, these are just some of the opportunities. And people often think, oh, I must go up from a pre-doctoral, doctoral, doctoral post-doctoral fellowship. That's not necessarily the case. Most people don't uh, go through that system. Um, and, and many of you will be aware that the Biomedical Research Centers has been a competition, 790 million pounds going to be given out over the next five years for medical research. There'll be a lot of training opportunities there. And each of those organizations listed at the bottom has got a capacity development uh, component. So there will be quite a lot of opportunities out there for you. Okay, so advanced fellowships, this is what you might be thinking going on to. And um, I joined the panels uh, this morning. So there's two panels actually going live, interviewing as we speak for advanced fellows today and tomorrow. Um, and this is a really critical fellowship and we want to invest more in this as well because it's a postdoctoral opportunity. So this is two to five years. You can apply in, uh, twice, uh, up to a total of eight years. But this gives you that protected postdoctoral research time. Um, and many people who, who get these at the senior level uh, will move into chairs. And the reason there's a high success rate of that is because you get protected research time. So 100% of your research time is bought out. Um, the, your research costs are paid, support post, uh, and any training that you need to do. So these are, this is a really, really good opportunity for you to be thinking about longer term. They're obviously competitive, uh, but they can make a huge difference to, to, to your career. Uh, and then this is a bit of a mouthful, it's the Advanced Clinical and Practitioner Academic Fellowship, the ACAF, and this is essentially a very similar scheme uh, for allied health professionals, so it's, it's that bit in the red that I showed on that slide. Um, and, and I think the fellowships I'm very passionate about because they basically transformed my career. So I had, I had a Wellcome Trust Fellowship to start with for my PhD and then three subsequent NHR uh, uh, fellowships up to a research professorship, uh, which I came off in 2020. Um, so, you know, you can go right up the, the ladder on these things um, and your career trajectory will be very steep because you're getting protected research time rather than doing all of the other things that we are exposed to in the ecosystem if you're not on personal fellowship funding. But it isn't the only way to do it, so I kind of stress that, that it isn't just a linear pathway. Lots of people will do lots of different things and come and go, uh, so that's worth remembering. Development Skills Enhancement Award, this is a one-year fellowship, and this is for NHR Academy members who are applying perhaps for another fellowship, need a bit more time, some more research skills, and this gives you uh, a bit of time uh, before you move on. By the way, these, these slides were made, made available to you um, uh, um, at the end of the meeting, so you don't need to write anything down. And then the SPARC, the Short Placement Award for Research Collaboration, was relatively new, but is now well-established, um, and it was an idea where basically you meet somebody here, they're in a different part of the country in a different part of NHR, and you can go and have a lab visit there. And we, we didn't know if this was going to work very well, and actually it's been spectacular. Um, so with really r relatively small pots of money, as you can see there, and there's a local authority one as well now. Um, the, the idea here is that somebody in one part of the country has got the research expertise, you need that research expertise, and with agreement from both parties, you'll go to that institution learn whatever skill it is that you need to do and then bring it back to your home institution. And that's worked incredibly well. So actually small pots of money to help you get there uh, means that you can develop new collaborations up and down the country. We're very keen, and I was very keen that um, bits of the infrastructure and different centers collaborate together because we all know that collaborative research ends up being the best research that you're gonna do. Okay, so what next? So plan ahead for opportunities and deadlines. 
Um, so you'll have lots of deadlines and unexpected things happening over the next couple of days. Some you'll know about, some you won't know about, but it all adds to the fun. Uh, look at the NIHR website and read the guidance. Uh, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and you can also sign up to the NIHR newsletters that we send out monthly. Um, and uh, if you've got any issues, then contact the NIHR Academy. So we're very keen to try and engage with uh, the community. We, our job is to serve and support the next generation of leaders, and that's why, we're, that's why we're in the roles that we're in. Okay, so next up, um, and, and I think this kind of exemplifies uh, how important training is, uh, Lucy Chappell is uh, um, uh, sort of Chief Executive Officer of NHR, uh, of the whole of NHR, and also Chief Scientific Advisor. Incredibly busy, uh, but has given up her time, and she's going to join us online, I hope. Thanks, Walget. I'm just going to wait for our AV team to confirm that you can hear me. Is that good? Lovely, that's great. Well, um, thank you very much, Waldrip, for that introduction and for inviting me to uh, come today. So as you've heard, I'm Chief Scientific Advisor, Chief Exec of NIHR, but I'm also a Professor of Obstetrics and a Consultant Obstetrician, and I've both been a trainee. Uh, Waldrip and I were NIHR research professors together, um, and I still run a, a multidisciplinary research group with ACFs, GRFs, postdocs, seeking funding at all stages. It's been a, a, a large part of my life for, for many years. Um, so today it's absolutely fantastic that we're announcing our amazing new research programme craft, especially for the camp. And, and by popular demand, uh, I'm calling it the better understanding of making people healthier, otherwise known as BUMPF. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's our new program. And your mission, as you've heard, is to, is to craft spectacularly good applications uh, that we can't help but want to fund. But actually, on a more serious note, this is a great opportunity to explore all the aspects of this crafting process. So what, what are we looking for? We're always looking for strong science with a clear research question. We are increasingly really focusing on deliverability and absolutely woven through it is the impact for public and patients. It often starts with a research question that matters, and I would emphasize that use your, utilize your PPI partners from the outset to find what matters to them and then continue to work with them as partners. I recently applied for an HTA grant uh, before I took this post. In, in fact, I applied four times, so three rejections. And for the fourth time of asking, we undertook a really substantial additional PPI piece to find out exactly what pregnant women wanted and why over and above our usual PPI. And it, there's no doubt that it really helped shape the application further. So which, which focuses should you be, be thinking about? Have a look at the seven strategic focuses of the NIHR in best research for best health and show us why these matter in your application. It's not bingo, you don't have to have a full house, but it helps if you can show why some of these are important and, and some of them are common themes, uh, working with underserved regions, being inclusive and should be in your applications. Who? Look around at your team. Think about who is involved in delivering the part of health or care service relevant to your research question and, and then pull in that team. Ask who is missing, who ought to be there. And if you can't immediately find someone, Find someone who is curious, who wants to come on this journey with you. They'll be out there and if you inspire them, they will come and join the team. And of course, the PPI partner who will walk the journey with you. And how? Be curious. Be curious from a science perspective because that's what drives us. Be challenging of each other to improve and weave in that innovation and that new ideas, not just a sort of a, a, a single formula. Be challenged and use the opportunity that this camp provides to escape from your usual silo and, and work in challenge from others. Be collaborative. Better science comes from diverse groups and sometimes we need to hear, hear views that we haven't heard before. Be considerate. Be considerate of each other's views. Others have got important things that, that you can we can all learn from. And be cheerful. Research is amazing and it's a good reason to get up each day. So what next? 
This is for fun and should be, but next time it will be for real. We invest in you as the research leaders of the future. I never imagined that I would be sitting here speaking to you, but I looked out for the opportunities and often the less obvious ones. And I found my passion and, and really set out to make a difference. You can make a difference too. And I hope you turn our bump into triumph instead. Thank you, Woolget. Very happy to take some questions if that's possible. And uh, if, if there's anyone that uh, anything that anyone would like to ask me. Great. Thanks, Lucy. Any questions from the audience? Nothing online. In stunned silence. Please feel free to ask. I, I might just comment on research path pathways and Really, mine have taken a number of different directions and they were not all planned. In fact, many of them were not. And I think that's a theme of a number of us. Very rarely are careers straight lines. Um, and as, as you come out of doctoral into postdoctoral and often interweaving careers in and out of the NHS or local authorities or other settings, um, be understand that there are many zigzags and many different ways to get to destinations. And sometimes the biggest opportunities come when you're not expecting them. Um, and to, to try and help find others around you who you trust to help help you navigate uh, is important. So there's both, you know, it always comes down to person, place, project. Think about your career um, route. Think about um, the opportunities in your own institution. I speak as a woman with, with three children. I didn't have opportunities to zigzag around the country, so I zigzagged in other ways um, and took on opportunities to collaborate with people outside of my field um, and, and did it through different routes. And also the projects. I've had a strong interest in maternal medicine and I've done a lot of work in pregnancy hypertension, but the opportunity came up unexpectedly to run a drug trial in, in cholestasis of pregnancy and that opened further doors. Um, so think of the, the multitude of ways uh, in, in which you can craft your research pathways and, and, and career pathways. Great, thanks Lucy. Yeah. We've got a, a question from one of our online delegates, um, from Lisa. Um, what has helped you persevere in the face of rejections, Lucy? That's such a good question. Um, I wonder about that because I, I think that, um, is it that my opportunities have been so different? No, I'm not sure it is. I think I have um, learnt from others and, and I've had very good mentors who have been there to pick up, pick me up and it's now what I do to my team um, to, to see the bigger picture and it's why I openly talk about the grants that I've rejected, the manuscripts that I've rejected, rather than pretending that those of us at the top have got these shiny polished CVs, which is all you see when you see a CV. And in fact, funnily enough, with one of the academic FYs I, I have looked after, she was asking herself, you know, uh, can I make it? And I went through my paper CV and I showed her all the bits that weren't on it, what we call our shadow CV, uh, the times when jobs hadn't worked out, the, the, the rejections, and, and yet we only show the, the, the grants that we get accepted typically. So it is about um, doing that and have, finding people who you trust and um, where you can go and sit in their office with with coffee and just talk it through and pick yourself up for the next time. Um, I've learned from the times when things have not gone to plan as much from when they have. I often learn more from the bumps in the road than from the smooth bits because it equips me um, with, with additional skills, but you need colleagues and a, a support network to help you through that. And actually, look around you at the camp today, uh, both virtually and in person. This will be, this is the start of your su support network and it comes in many shapes and sizes. Great. I, 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 I think I just follow on from that, that actually a successful academic is just one that's had slightly fewer rejections than somebody else. I mean, it's, it's a good point. You know, I talk about Gary's success. Gary will also tell you that he's written about 10 other grants this year that didn't get awarded. So. It really is um, persevering um, and having that support network to, to rely on. 
Family and kids are also quite a good one, because they don't get too excited when you get a grant, and they just ignore you when you don't get a grant. So, <laughs> quite good. so when, when, I got my, when I got my chair, my youngest, who was about five or six then, said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm so proud that you're a professor. And I was like, oh. And then she said, Daddy, what's a professor? <laughs> so it kind of helps you bring things down. And then the research professorship at two million, you know, they kind of were really, really pleased at the dinner table. And then it was about kind of November time. And they said, but do we get better Christmas presents? <laughs> no. Do you get paid more? No. <laughs> uh, so they carried on eating their dinner. So it's quite good to, to, so to yeah, bump some waves. I, I had something similar when I got my research professorship, which is, yeah, great. And then uh, literally about two seconds later, what's for tea? <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that kind of... I, I went for a job a, a little while ago and didn't get it. And my teenage daughter sent me something which um, says, she, she's, she, needless to say, she WhatsApped it to me. She said, when life shuts a door, open it again. It's a door. That's how they work. And there's nothing like your teenage daughter giving advice about uh, opening doors. So it's now my screensaver on my phone just to remind me that, you know, this morning in this job, somebody closed a door. Just go back and, and seek to open it again. I think the other thing is, is um, you, you often hold yourself back, but actually, what's the worst that can happen? You don't get it. It's not a big deal, is it? I mean, you know, so you do have to get used to that rejection phase and then anybody who sent off a manuscript I'm sure all your manuscripts getting first time but you know they come back send it off come back send it off so it becomes part of life but I think you've got to just got to see the bigger picture so stamina I think is is, is one of the, the the key factors that keeps you going great yeah there's a question there Thank you. Um, sorry, I just um, so I understand the value of PPI in applications, but are they all weighted the same? So if you have like a a project that is maybe method methodology focused and less patient um, focused or heavy, do the applications get graded the same way? Even though you, I guess I'm trying to understand how much PPI is enough for a project that is in answering a question that is targeting, you know, patient needs. Do, do you just do it and tick a box, or how have other people actually navigated that territory in a meaningful way and ended up being successful? Thank you. Shall I pick that up? Yeah, sure. It's a good question, and I would suggest that there is impact to patient or public in every single application that NHR funds. And it's a question of um, finding that, looking at what that impact is and asking who's shaped that. Um, and, and because even behind a methodology project, there's a so what. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that the shape of that PPI will be different depending on what the project is. But I think the camp is a really good opportunity to explore that. And you've also got support from uh, people like the Research Design Service, the RDS, who have got excellent PPI uh, support to say, what would that look like? And why, how would uh, a PPI member shape that? And it might be as much about what is the methodology question seeking to understand and what would what would that mean? What if you had to explain it, and you may well have this opportunity, to a PPI partner in a way that made sense as to why would the NIHR invest in this? So you're, you're completely right about shaping it to the project, but I, I would anticipate that every single NIHR funded project has got an opportunity there. And it, you have those conversations, not just with PPI partners, but with other people in the system to say, it does this feel about right. Great, any final questions? Yep. From our online audience, um, from Rachel. So as a funder, is it preferable to see an applicant build on the same topic as the PhD 
would it be acceptable to change to a different program or a topic of research also within the applicant's area of expertise? Well, I think that's a great question and Walter and I might have different views, but we'll see. So my view is that if we want to grow you as a researcher, then I encourage people to look for a, a related but not identical topic with, with and to, to grow their method, methodology skills. Because going from doctoral to postdoctoral, I think we should be investing in you um, and that is typically picking up a often a it could be a different topic with a link or it could be a related topic it's very rarely a carbon copy of what you did in your phd because that doesn't provide as many opportunities for growth and again with with my group i i look at what methodology they've done and particularly for those who want to go on to be research leaders where they have to manage a group with a quite often quite a range of methodology i offer postdoc as an opportunity to pick up a relevant additional metho methodology so so not something that's just pointless but something that will grow them as a researcher so for for the the postdocs that i look after it is it's never a carbon copy for those reasons so ask what it looks like for personal growth and what it looks like for growth in a science sense. Wiljit, would you yeah, go along with that? Yeah, and, and I think the only thing I'd add to that is the fundamental thing that the panel are looking for is, for the advanced fellowships, for example, is do they see the potential of that person being a future leader? If the answer is yes, and part of that is going to be the research question. So I wouldn't do it just around the methodology. The, the bottom line is you need to go in there and say, I'm going to cure cancer at the end of this fellowship, and if you could, and it was realistic, and I'm going to develop into the next research leader, you will get the fellowship. So it's more, more important, how important is the research question, and then have you, are you surrounded by people that are going to deliver it? But they are looking for a step change, because as Lucy said, if, you, if you're just doing more of the same, it's not going to get you to the next level. So each of the fellowships, the idea is that you jump more quickly to the next level. And, and these, the NHR research professorships, as an example, are transformative. That word is overused, not really for the RPs. And, and so on a smaller level for any other fellowship, it is that step change, not just more of the same. It's an opportunity for you as individuals as well. Great. Great. Okay, Lucy, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, okay. Wilgit, and, and I hope it, the camp goes really well for all of you. Great. I think we should give Lucy a round of applause for joining us. Thanks.